Okay, and as I just said, my name is uh, Michael Lecker. Uh, I'm the community lead organizer for IMALS. Uh, for those of you who don't know, IMALS is a patient-centric movement revolutionizing how to end diseases. Uh, the nonprofit is trying to provide critical resources to patients, caregivers, and loved ones. Um, what we try to do is empower um, people to, uh, to do the work that they would like to do to end ALS. Um, we were founded in 2019, um, and we are born out of the desire to rewrite the ALS story and um, make it possible to find cures and treatments for ALS. Um, with all that being said, I want to turn it over to our advocates as quickly as possible because this is what they're truly about. I'm very excited to be here for this, <clears throat> for this talk. Um, and so I'll turn it over to uh, Michael Robinson. Thank you, Michael. Um, and for those that don't know me, I'm Michael Robinson. Uh, I am a patient with ALS. I was diagnosed in uh, 2015. Um, I'm also a physician, uh, Canadian trained um, in adult and child and adolescent psychiatry, and then uh, did a fellowship in the US uh, in psychosomatic medicine where I focused my career thereafter. Um, I spent 15 years in the pharmaceutical uh, company community um, where I held, uh, where I did positions in clinical drug development uh, worldwide and um, uh, led the U.S. medical organization at AbbVie last before I retired due to ALS. Um, I'd like to first thank IMALS for hosting this. I want to say first and foremost, this is meant to be a discussion of the issue and topic. And, and we'll try to make it just that. And we are pleased to have uh, the lead author and uh, Lisa Iazzoni, who is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, uh, based at the Health Policy Research Center at Mass General Hospital. And she has been conducting numerous studies examining healthcare disparities for per persons with disability. She's published a couple of books, one entitled When Walking Fails, published in 2003 and a second one called uh, More Than Ramps, A Guide to Improving Healthcare Quality and Access for People with Dis Disabilities in 2006. She represents the Boston Center for Independent Living and has chaired the Medical Diagnostic Equipment Accessibility Standards Advisory Committee for the US and uh, is a member of the National Academy of Medicine and, and the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine. So welcome, Dr. Iazzoni. Uh, she's asked me to refer her to her as Lisa hereafter, and I will, uh, to keep it a discussion. And in and, and, and doing so, we'll get started. And I wanted to first frame the topic of the discussion and that we're gonna be talking about physician perceptions of people living with a disability and their health care. And I'm going to tell you the history behind why this came up. Um, I've been going through my own, and, and I'll tell you more about my own experience, uh, potential experience with this topic. And um, I came across, as I always do, I get health alerts uh, for journal articles that I, that I follow. And I got an alert of uh, this article being published last month in the Journal of Health Affairs. And I read it immediately because I thought it was a very interesting topic. And because of the experience I was having, this just spoke to me in volumes. And um, I thought it was an incredibly important discussion to have um, and awareness to bring to the community of patients uh, that we have here. And as such, we're here and talking about it. Um, I've sorry, I've, I've introduced myself and I've so I in, also in my medical career, I, I held numerous positions at various universities um, and I'm a member of the IMALS clinical trials team that uh, I joined in 2020. Um, unfortunately, my joining of the IMALS group was precipitated by a colleague that worked at the same company who also had ALS and was diagnosed after me, who I worked with. So it was unfortunately a very small community uh, of people. Um, we've introduced Dr. Iazzoni, Lisa, and we'll get started on the topic. To frame the issue, I first want, 
there are 61 million Americans with some type of disability and these numbers are growing. And when we talk about disability, we talk about the all encompassing disability. It's physical disability, you know, disability can come in many forms, physical, intellectual, uh, mental. Um, there are some people with, with what's called invisible disabilities where their medical conditions aren't uh, very visible to the, to the outside world. And um, I'll have Dr. Iazoni or Lisa talk a little bit further about that um, in terms of what disabilities were studied within this paper. Um, we do know that, that disparities exist uh, for people with disabilities. They exist in many different areas, in screening and preventive services in medicine, cancer diagnosis and treatment, reproductive care and pregnancy, uh, how people communicate with healthcare uh, professionals and satisfaction with care. And these disparities, um, there are many factors that can contribute to why these disparities exist. And broadly speaking, they can be categorized into two high level areas, those that are patient factors and those that are healthcare system factors. Some of the patient factors, uh, just naming a few are, you know, often people with um, disabilities are have complex underlying health conditions, as conditions or, um, we do know, um, unfortunately, that um, disadvantages in social determinants of health, such as income, are more frequently seen in patients with a disability, as well as some of the patient preferences for care. There can be, I, we can talk a whole lot about different system level factors, factors as well. But in short, you, inadequate training uh, of healthcare professionals in patients with disability during their training, and I can speak to that. Um, I'm sure Dr. Uh, Iazoni can as well. Um, effective communication accommodations, um, physical access barriers, and inadequate knowledge uh, among the physician community of the legal requirements under the ADA Act. I'll just briefly mention the physical access barriers and, and to, to show what awareness can do. Um, my good friend is, and my best man was, was is a dentist, and um, he recently is actually going undergoing a, a new construction of a medical professional building. And it was me getting ALS and him spending time with me in Chicago, traveling around the, the city in a wheelchair, that he realized, and did, it wasn't until then that he realized what a day in the life of a person living in a wheelchair was like. And it was that that prompted him to um, build his building completely ADA accessible with elevators and lifts and ramps. And, and, um, and all it took was his awareness one day of, of following me around in a wheelchair in a city and seeing what it was like. And he, you know, the light bulb went off and he realized that this is an issue and uh, he did something about it. And so uh, awareness goes a long way on these issues. And don't assume that uh, we're all completely insightful and aware that, that we may be biased or, or behaving in certain ways. So we're here to talk about this, this article the, the, entitled Physician Perceptions of, of Patients Living with Disabilities and Their Care. And we want to specifically focus, very little, if, if any, in terms of prior to this study, has been spent in terms of studying the attitudes of physicians and specifically whether the physicians have implicit biases or explicit biases around people living with a disability that can impact their care, potentially. Um, and in this paper, kind of the high level, and we'll go into in the discussion, but overall, if you haven't read the paper, the overall conclusions, um, in total 714 physicians were surveyed across um, several different specialties as well as family medicine. And of those uh, that were surveyed, 82.4% reported that people with a significant disability have a worse quality of life than people without a disability. Just think about that because I, I know I've been living with a disability for five years and I am perfectly happy with my quality of life. Um, as it stands at this point. In addition, 41, roughly 41% 41 of physicians felt very confident in their ability to provide the same level of care. Just think about that for a second as well. The majority of physicians do not feel very confident about their ability to provide the same level of care to a patient with a disability. 
That's striking. In addition, 56.5% strongly agreed that they welcomed patients with disability into their practice. Um, and then the flip side of that is almost 50% didn't. Um, so I think it's, in addition, one fifth or 18% strongly agree that the healthcare system often treats patients with disability unfairly. So these brief conclusions in reading the abstract and then reading the paper and looking at the data in more detail, I was really struck by this topic and provided, I, get, was, I wanted to really give this a lot of thought. So let me tell you what I was going through at the time and what I'm still kind of going through. This is me, my, my brief medical history. I have ALS, but what I'm also currently dealing with, with is chronic recurrent diverticulitis. I've had several episodes. I'm, I've had hospital admissions. I've had IV antibiotics. I've seen gastroenterologists. I've seen colorectal surgeons and, and you name it. Um, Right now, my status is I am approaching uh, pursuing surgery and see the surgeon uh, next week. And I've been really unable to advance my diet uh, past liquids, essentially. Um, and I was getting extremely frustrated with the medical community and seemingly not listening to me and my symptoms. And I had repeated experience. Now I've seen multiple surgeons and I've seen multiple gastroenterologists and I've had repeated experiences where the physician is looking at the computer and seeing results of, of, of tests and not listening to me and making decisions based on what they see on the computer. What they see on the computer is a patient who's diagnosed with ALS. And what do you assume when you see an ALS diagnosis. You assume that most patients are going to die within two to five years and you're terminal, right? My case of ALS, unfortunately, is a bit different in that I'm a slow progressor. I had limb onset in my feet. And I'm, while, I'm, while I spend majority of my time in, in a wheelchair, I still can ambulate some. And so I do spend some time ambulating during the course of the day. And my ALS hasn't appreciably affected my ability to speak um, or my, my hand, hand dexterity. My hands are weak and stuff, but, but not to the degree that I have significant functional impairment. So I was seeing doctors for this chronic diverticulitis. I was not being listened to. Um, and it was a discussion that was precipitated by a colleague of mine who was a good friend in Canada. And we were talking about my experience. We were talking about my symptoms and we were wondering what to do. And he was helping me think through the issue. And he is the one, it wasn't me. He is the one that brought up, do you think it's ALS? Do you think that your doctors are making treatment recommendations on the assumption that you're gonna die soon? because they see ALS in your chart and they don't spend a lot of time with you as a patient. Um, and I think that part of this was likely aggravated by the COVID scenario in that a lot of visits are virtual. Um, but so I thought, I, I really gave thought to this and I asked myself, this, this could be going on. And in short, I ended up confronting one of the physicians that was uh, caring for me at the time and asked them, do you think that this, do you think that my ALS diagnosis is impacting your recommendations for care? And I came, honestly, I came, I have no problem being direct <laughs> as another physician with, with my fellow colleagues. And so I was very direct and to my surprise and to his, their credit, uh, they acknowledged that that was probably playing a significant role in the recommendations that they were making. And it was that discussion that then led to a discussion about more aggressive treatment options that he would be offering 
a patient without a disability in my scenario and without the ALS diagnosis. So I lived through a real life experience that happened exactly around the time that this article was coming out and confronted the phys one of the physicians that was caring for me about the issue. And they acknowledged that that was probably occurring. So I thought if this is occurring like this, I wonder how many other ALS patients experience the same thing or maybe experiencing this, a similar thing and not knowing that it's occurring. And what can we do to initiate the discussion on this topic? What can we do as patient advocates to facilitate getting quality care um, regardless of our diagnosis or what disabilities we may or may not have? Um, and so, I really stress that in my experience in the medical field and in living with ALS, that I've had to have constant self-advocacy on my, my medical care. And I will say my medical care outside of ALS. My ALS care has always been fantastic. Um, the doctors have been extremely helpful and when I first encountered this issue in terms of potentially being my ALS diagnosis, biasing other physicians and how they approach treatment recommendations for me, I first talked to my ALS doctor in the clinic and before I talked to the physician directly. And they acknowledged that this actually, this, this was a reasonable um, um, theory uh, to discuss with the, the physician. And the ALS clinic offered complete support and assistance for me talking to the physician and helping them, helping educate them on the type of ALS I have um, so that um, appropriate treatment recommendations can be made in the context of how I am experiencing ALS. And it was helpful and it was successful and I felt supported. Um, and it was a worthwhile, meaningful discussion to have. So because of this, um, and I want to, one, one final conclusion of, of the article, a couple of final conclusions were, and I really agree with it. The study really underscores that many physicians perceive uh, that patients with a disability have a worse quality of life. Um, and confidence in being able to provide the same quality care was also strongly associated with how well they welcome or how strongly they welcomed patients with disabilities into their practice. So with that, I'd like to um, get started on the discussion and invite Lisa to make some comments perhaps on her, on her paper, um, on maybe perhaps her books or the subject in general, and then we can start having a discussion uh, and engaging the, the, all of you there on the phone. Thank you, Michael. It's really wonderful to be able to join all of you this afternoon. Um, I do feel that when Michael introduced me, I sounded really fancy. <laughs> I'm like, I've got all these qualifications. And so Michael and I had a little get together yesterday so he could get to know me, I could get to know him. And so I need to tell you a little bit about myself and why, even though I've got this fancy MD degree after my name, I might have certain attitudes about the medical field that might be reflected in some of what I do. And that is that I've had multiple sclerosis for 44 years. Um, I didn't know I had it when I started at Harvard Medical School on September 8th, 1980, which is now 40 years and about six months ago, so a long time ago. Um, I'd had about four years of on again, off again symptoms that were just too weird and wacky to explain to anybody. When they'd come, I couldn't speak what they were about in English, and I just wait a while and they'd go away. And I was young and invincible, and so I never got myself worked up. But then when I started at HMS, um, the symptoms came back with a vengeance. I was doing things like running into trees and walking into cars. And at that point, I kind of had to pay attention to them. And so I 
went to a neurologist and I was diagnosed with MS at the end of my first semester at medical school. And so 1980, the Americans with Disabilities Act, 1990. So I was diagnosed with MS 10 years before the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed. And I won't take the time to go into what it was like during my four years at Harvard Medical School, other than to say it was pretty brutal. And when I went to um, speak to the advisor who would be advising me on applying for internships and residency, he said that the medical school leadership had decided in their infinite wisdom that they were not going to write a recommendation for me to apply for an internship or residency. And so even though I'd graduated and done fine and done all the clerkships and everything I needed to do, I was not able to apply to become an intern or resident. And so even though I have an MD degree from Harvard Medical School, I never practiced medicine a day in my life. I also was taught during those four years. Now, mind you that this was like back in the era when women were ashamed to admit that they had breast cancer. Um, you know, most of you are probably too young to remember that, but it was only when Nancy Reagan and Betty Ford were in public with having breast cancer that all of a sudden pink ribbons started going out and women started being willing to talk about the fact that they had breast cancer. And so this was back in an era when it was a, a you know, a mark of shame if you had a disabling condition and especially a mark of shame if you had a condition that physicians and medicine could not cure. And so I was taught during my four years at HMS, never, ever, ever to talk about my MS. And so I literally for a dozen years after I graduated from Harvard Medical School, never, ever, ever spoke publicly about it. Even though in 1988, I started using a wheelchair and my friends and colleagues was, were really worried that my MS had progressed and something was going on with me. But no, it was only that I kind of like a light bulb had gone off. And I realized if I was going to be traveling to Washington all the time for meetings relating to the work that I was doing, which was on health policy, that I wanted to be able to carry a suitcase. I didn't want to fall. I wanted to be able to get around. And so I started using a wheelchair and it was the smartest thing that I started to do. Um, but people were terrified when I started to do that. I should have told them that no, it was a really good decision that I finally agreed to do that. So to make, I've already kind of made the a short story a little longer than you probably wanted to hear to learn a little bit about me, but um, it was only once I became a full professor at Harvard Medical School that I, I took a deep breath and I thought, okay, they can't fire me anymore. And let me just parenthetically say that the reason I became a full professor and the way that you do that is to write a thousand papers that get put onto dusty shelves and nobody ever reads, okay? <laughs> um, but the reason I became a full professor is because I overcompensated. It was classic overcompensation because of terror that I was going to be fired because of my disability. And so that is what I attribute all my success to is classic overcompensation syndrome. Plus the fact that I had some really, really wonderful interdisciplinary colleagues who really kind of we worked together, statisticians, you know, people who were um, really great methodologists and I were able to partner to do some great work. But then when I finally took a pause and said, okay, what do I really want to do now that I'm a full professor and maybe they're not going to fire me, even though even today, if you ask me in 2021, I'm still not entirely sure that they wouldn't fire me because of disability. Oh, I know this is being recorded, but you know, hopefully nobody will tell my bosses about this. But I'm still not entirely sure that I'm safe, but I probably am okay. But anyway, I, I decided to take a deep breath and say, okay, what would be really meaningful to me? I'd wanted to go into medicine to help people. What could I do to help people? And so I looked around and there wasn't much research about disability back in this time. It was really in the late 1990s. There was a little tiny bit of thread of disability related research back then. But so I started doing research on disability and disability disparities. And I've been doing that ever since. And as part of that, I've probably, I've, 
I've conducted research with all sorts of different data sets, you know, ranging from huge administrative databases, cancer registries, enormous federal surveys, but also interview studies with 20 people. Um, and I've probably interviewed about 200 people um, in depth for all of my studies. And what I would hear from people with disability is all of the barriers that they would face in terms of getting healthcare. And um, they would face barriers about exam tables, not having an accessible weight scale, um, not having their physician talk to them about certain um, types of subjects. But it also became clear that they felt like they faced erroneous assumptions from their doctors, that their doctors made assumptions about what their goals in life were, what their preferences for care were, that did not comport with the people's own views about what they wanted from their doctors. And so um, we and my colleagues and I applied to NIH and we were fortunate to get a grant to do the first ever national survey of doctors. And their perceptions of and experiences with caring for people with disability. And as Michael said, it, this was a nationally representative sample. Um, for those of you who know about surveys, we um, had a 61% response rate, which is really, really good. And the way that we got that is that we put a crisp $50 bill in every survey that we mailed to doctors, because the dirty little secret is that doctors will not answer surveys unless you pay them to do it. <laughs> Um, so, um, but we also had had great survey co colleagues at UMass Boston Center for Survey Research who did telephone follow ups and so we had, um, you know, really good response rates and, and this survey though, because we could only ask questions that would take about 15 minutes to respond to, because we needed to keep our response rate high that it was very broad and shallow so we kind of covered a huge extent of topics, but very shallow. And so, um, so Michael's already kind of summarized the top line findings for this particular module about physicians' attitudes towards people with disability, but I could not tell you why the physicians responded the way that they did. We know that they did respond this way, but I can't tell you why. I can make inferences, and Michael could probably make inferences from having been in the medical profession, but the survey itself does not tell you why. So again, you know, Michael gave you the top line findings that 82.4% of physicians said that people with significant disability have worse quality of life. Only 40.7% of physicians strongly agree that, um, that uh, they feel very confident in providing care to equal quality of care to people with disability. And only 56% of physicians um, welcome people with disability into their practices. Now, um, some of you might have heard of something called the social desirability bias in surveys that people when they answer surveys generally want to answer surveys in the same way that they think that the surveyors want them to answer they want to please the surveyors and so they want to give a socially acceptable answer and so I was expecting that doctors would view quality of life of people with disability as worse than for other people. I just didn't think it was going to be 82.4% of the doctors, you know, because we also gave them the option of saying that people with disability have the same quality of life as other people, but no, they didn't check the same, they checked worse. And so that really suggests to me, and maybe we can get into this in the discussion period that they feel very confident that people with disability have worse quality of life. They actually do believe that that is the case. And so there wouldn't be anybody who would question that. And, you know, I will say again, from my own experiences, um, you know, as having been a wheelchair user, working in hospitals all the time, that I experienced erroneous assumptions from doctors. Um, you know, like, um, Quite a few years ago now, I was rolling around the first floor of a hospital where I was working and I ran into a physician who said, hi, Lisa. And I said, hi there, Dr. So-and-so. And he said, you know, it's always so great to see you because you always seem so cheerful. That must be because of the inappropriate euphoria of multiple sclerosis. Wow. 
Okay. Uh, um, inappropriate euphoria of multiple sclerosis. Well, I guess back in that era, there was some theory that people with MS had inappropriate euphoria, but no, it was just, you know, when I'm with professional colleagues, I want to look cheerful. I want to smile. I want to be positive. Um, you know, and so the fact that somebody would actually say that to me face to face, this must be your inappropriate euphoria, suggests that they as physicians believe that they know something that tells them about your life. And they are kind of willing to say that to you. And so, um, so that's something that we'll probably be able to get into when we get to the discussion section. But Michael actually asked me to tell a story about um, how these misperceptions of healthcare professionals actually can potentially be life-threatening. And certainly in the story that Michael told you about his diverticulitis, that is something that has you know, a big effect on his, his um, uh, quality of daily life in terms of diet and, and how he feels about his, um, uh, his GI functioning. And, and that's important to him, um, obviously. But I just wanted to tell you a story about um, my best friend. Okay, so, um, and this is a story that goes back to 2015. And um, my best friend is also named Michael. Okay, we've got lots of Michaels here. <laughs> um, and at the time, Michael was 61 years old. Um, and he had a 21 year history of primary progressive MS. That is the less common variant of MS. It's the kind of variant of MS where men and women have equal rates of it. Okay, the type of MS that I have is relapsing remitting where it's primarily women, but primary progressive is typically diagnosed in middle age and it's equal kind of for men and women. Um, he was born in Birmingham, England, exactly nine days before I was. Um, and, um, and he has a PhD in physics from Oxford University. So this is a really smart guy. When he was doing his PhD, Physics. He was living in Geneva, working at the CERN physics laboratory, you know, the particle collider thing. And so he would be out on his bicycle, riding around the Alps with high altitude, long distance cycling. He did his postdoc at Cornell, came to the United States in 1981 for that and became an avid speed skater and cross country skier. So he was just this endurance athlete. But then he was diagnosed with PPMS at age 42 and he needed a wheelchair at within seven years. And at this point that I'm talking about, he is completely quadriplegic. He can't move any part of his body at all below his neck. And he uses a rehab power wheelchair um, to get around. And however, he gets around a lot in it. So after about three and a half years of active use, he had put about 2,500 miles on oh. the wheelchair. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so he was getting around. So Michael at this time was a member of a very tightly managed care um, health plan. So um, Michael, again, um, is my best friend and I became his healthcare proxy. Um, and um, so at this time I was his healthcare proxy, but I respected his desire to advocate for himself. Again, he's a really smart guy. He like this other Michael that we've just been talking with, um, your Michael, um, liked to advocate for himself and wasn't afraid of kind of speaking to his healthcare providers. But in March of 2015, my Michael started complaining of loss of appetite, early satiety, in other words, he'd feel full pretty quickly, occasional vomit, vomiting and nausea, reduced food intake and change in bowel patterns. His lower abdomen was becoming distended. He asked his managed care plan repeatedly for a GI evaluation, but um, the nurse practitioner failed to schedule one. So in May of 2015, his blood pressure rose to 160 over 100 to 110 diastolic, despite previously normal values that were not controlled by medication. In June of 2015, 
he started having trouble saying more than several words before needing to take a breath. And in early July of 2015, his primary care physician, who was part of this very intensely managed care plan, visited him at home for his six month checkup, but did not examine him, saying he could not get Michael out of his wheelchair. But for those of you who know anything about rehab power wheelchairs, you'll realize how fallacious that is because you can kind of lower a wheelchair power wheelchair until somebody's completely supine. And so you can actually do physical exams on a rehab power wheelchair, which my internist has actually done on a number of occasions for me when I'm in my rehab power wheelchair. And the physician didn't even lift up his shirt. So again, um, Michael is nine days older than I am. And so I started getting into the habit of taking the train down from Boston, where I live, to visit Michael, who lives outside of Princeton in New Jersey. And um, so I went down in early July in 2015 to visit Michael. Um, I found him haggard. He was unable to eat. He vomited his shrimp that we gave him for his birthday dinner. <laughs> Um, he had difficulty talking, he had a hugely distended lower abdomen, and he also had grossly swollen lower legs. Um, and even though I respected Michael's desire to advocate for himself, I know that even though I've got an MD degree and never practiced, at least I can talk doctor. You know, that's one thing that I can do. I can talk doctor. And so I got Michael's permission to actively advocate for him with his health plan. And so the following Friday, Michael had a CT scan. Now, over the weekend after the CT scan, he had a fever of 102. He couldn't eat. The visiting nurse prescribed Tylenol. Early Monday morning, as early as I felt it was kind of like even possible, like 7.30, I telephoned his PCP to find out the results of the Friday CT scan. And the PCP said, you know, Lisa, I hope you're sitting down because I have some bad news for you. And I was like, I know what you're going to say. <laughs> I knew exactly what was happening. He said, look, Michael had a lower abdominal mass. And at that point, I said to this doctor, look, I do not want Michael being cared for at the community hospital that you have as part of your network. I want Michael to be taken to a major academic medical center in a nearby city. And so when Michael went to that nearby academic medical center in a nearby city, um, he was found to have bilateral femoral vein clots. And on July 30th, 2015, I got up and got on the 6 a.m. Amtrak train from Boston, got to Philadelphia at noon. So I was able to sign the permission forms um, and um, for the surgery. And Michael had a 15 pound gastrointestinal stromal tumor removed from his lower abdomen. And he had an inferior varina cave or IVC filter placed in his lower big vein that go, returns blood from the lower limbs back to the heart to prevent clots from reaching his lungs. His blood pressure returned to normal because he no longer had a 15 pound tumor resting on his, his huge veins and arteries. His breathing returned to baseline pattern because he no longer had a tumor pressing up on his diaphragm. Um, he takes daily imatinib and fortunately has had no side effects. And literally today, he is going to see his oncologist in Philadelphia, but he had an MRI scan just a couple of weeks ago that shows that he's still tumor-free now, 56 months later. So clearly Michael got substandard care, but was there more going on? Now he had a home care nurse who visited him every day to give him medications and the nurse had thought he was getting fat because he can't exercise. But was there something called diagnostic overshadowing going on? What diagnostic overshadowing is, it's a term that applies to when doctors attribute every possible symptom that a patient comes to them with to their underlying disability. So, okay, MS does cause constipation. Maybe the doctor thought that his grossly distended abdomen was because of excessive constipation. Really? Now, severe MS can cause breathing problems, 
maybe they thought that he was at end stage MS because he could no longer say more than two or three words without having to take a breath. But I did a literature search and there was no relationship between MS and hypertension. So what happened was um, I actually went down to New Jersey again about two weeks later to meet Michael when he came back home from the hospital um, to wait for his mother to come from England. She was gonna be staying with him. And so I was able to just kind of like innocently talk to like the home care nurse who told me Michael wasn't exercising and talk to the doctors. But the person who gave me the clue was the social worker. She said that the goal of this health plan was palliation, to mm. keep patients comfortable. And that Michael was so disabled that all they wanted to do was just make sure that he was comfortable. Okay, so I looked up in the World Health Organization um, definition of palliation. The definition of palliation is not that you withdraw all care. The definition of palliation is that if somebody comes to you with symptoms, you evaluate them. You try to figure out what's going on and then you treat them to the extent that you possibly can to improve the patient's um, uh, feelings and their symptoms and their signs and possibly their longevity, you know, in Michael's case, you don't abandon patients. And yet, because this health plan had palliation as their major goal, Michael could have died easily because of this tumor. And so I view his story as kind of like an extreme example of how erroneous assumptions of physicians about people with significant disability can literally be life-threatening. Okay. Thank so. you, Lisa. I, I, I asked Lisa to share that because even though it's not ALS, it, the, the parallels are enormous. And um, given, given we're 45 minutes in, let's just open it up to questions, Michael. Uh, yeah, we have a question from Gwen, um, which I'll read unless uh, Gwen um, says um, she wants to speak it. Um, what advice would you give to patients who are experiencing symptoms but are hitting a wall uh, with their clinical team? Example, similar to Michael, I had a doctor who was very good at typing, not so good at active listening. Thank you. That is such a difficult question. And, and Michael Robinson, I mean, that's what you are kind of doing. You are hitting a wall like that as well. And I actually am an advocate of doctor shopping if you need to, um, you know, but, but that is a very difficult thing to, to leave a doctor um, that, that you feel like you have a relationship with, or it's often very difficult to find new doctors nowadays, especially if you have a significant disabling condition. So I would basically say, um, look, can I at least speak to your nurse practitioner? Or is there a specialist that I can speak to or call and make an appointment with a specialist um, or complain to somebody who's higher up? Um, because one of the things that is literally true is that um, healthcare settings do not like to have patients who are actively unhappy. And so I think that if you feel that you have reached a brick wall, that you have made your case, that you have this concern, that it hasn't been looked at, ask to speak to the department chair or ask to speak to um, somebody who's in leadership at the hospital, write a letter to the CEO. I mean, that's kind of escalating it, but um, sometimes that's what needs to happen. Um, I think that, you know, obviously you're going to start with your own practitioner, but it sounds like, and I'm so sorry, you know, it just sounds like you are meeting a brick wall. And, and so also having other people with you, um, you know, sometimes um, it, it really is literally true and it's really horrible to have to say this, but if you can have, um, a trusted person who's a caregiver with you, who you feel like you're really on the same page with that person in the room with you to kind of like 
say to the doctor, maybe you could play a good cop, bad cop. And that person could say, you know, Dr. So-and-so, you're not actually listening to my friend. Can you just maybe answer her question? Um, you know, that maybe that might be a strategy as well. Thank you, Lisa. And I'll, I'll make a comment as well in that uh, for everything that Lisa said is, and, and your ALS doctor, your ALS doctor can play a key central role in, in liaising with other fellow medical colleagues um, to help you get heard. Um, I know my ALS doctor was more than willing to do that. I didn't need to have that happen, but um, your ALS doctor is also a huge, can be a big advocate for you in terms of the other interdisciplinary care or other medical professionals that, that might see you. Um, unfortunately, I think COVID has also added to this and, 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 and people are scared. So I, forget that. I saw two, I saw two colorectal surgeons I specifically took myself into the hospital to be seen because I have an acute abdominal condition that I'm considering surgery for and not a single one laid hands on me. You, it doesn't take a physician to know that that's not how you practice medicine. And that's when I chose, uh, like Lisa says, I'm doctor shopping and I'm seeing the third one next week because I just will not go under the knife on somebody I just don't trust. And that's, that's a sad case of, now, that's just my experience. Um, not all are like that. I see many fantastic doctors along the way. Um, uh, and in my ALS journey to being diagnosed, uh, I was scheduled to have neurosurgery. I was scheduled to have back surgery with four doctors seeing me, one doing a two minute physical exam that I knew was wrong. So I took myself to an orthopedic surgeon who actually was the one that got me in the next day to a peripheral neurologist that headed down the, the ALS path. So there are, there are people, there are doctors that will sit, will listen to the patient. Um, and sometimes you have to be more forceful and persistent to get yourself heard. Michael, any more questions? There are no questions okay. right now. Um, I actually had a question though, uh, based off Two things. I've I have heard. other things we can talk about too, so we're good. <laughs> oh, uh, actually, um, I'm going to put my question on hold okay. because Morgan has a question. Morgan, you're on. Thanks. Um, so my issue is, um, I know if you're like not comfortable with like the healthcare system, um, it can be really difficult to advocate for yourself. Um, do you guys think that there is something that can be done to kind of attack like the root of this problem by like addressing this implicit bias that physicians have? Lisa, I'll, I'll, I'm going to make a comment first, Lisa, and then I'll turn it over to you because it fits into what I wanted to comment on. Yes. Um, in my in my years of in medical training and in medical school. I was also uh, in an academic center and taught medical students. Um, and I'll, I mean, don't assume, I, I, one thing is don't assume the doctor knows, knows, knows everything they need to know. I mean, it's, it's, there's lots of gaps in training. In, in medical training, when I trained, you got one hour of pain management training. That was it, um, apart from your clerks, you know, your physical rotations in the hospital. Um, I gave one hour of HIV medication training. That's it. And that was in the mid, that was, that was in the height of HIV. Now there's a test that Lisa might talk about called the implicit associations test. And I want to kind of, I want to bring this up because if doctors are, if physicians are having biases, um, 
and maybe not approaching care or not listening as, as you would expect or hope, it doesn't mean they're bad doctors. It, it, it may mean that they just have some biases that they're not aware of. And I'm gonna give you this example. I did this disability um, uh, association, a disability implicit association exam. It takes just a few minutes on the computer and I can send out the website if anybody else wants to do stuff like that. But I found my results to show that I am moderate to strongly preferring able-bodied people over disabled. And one would think on the surface, well, why? How is that, that you're, you're biased towards able-bodied people and you have a disability and live in a wheelchair? These are the things I wish I had known myself when I was practicing because awareness and insight that you might have that bias, it isn't until then that you can do anything about it, right? But if I'm aware that I might have this bias, I can approach the patient in a conscious manner, aware of that potential bias and, and be more open to considering alternatives or other things that might be going on, et cetera. So I think half the part of the battle is just knowing it exists and knowing um, that there are biases that are potential. Lisa, any comments? Yeah, I think that this is gonna be a tough nut to crack um, because, okay, say we increase medical education about disability, which is happening in some medical schools, but certainly not the vast majority. And when I say it is happening in some medical schools is maybe now they have two hours rather than just one hour about disability. That's still, you know, it takes seven years to train a doctor at the most basic level, you know, four years of medical school and three years of internship and residency. And so that's a long pipeline. And some of us um, need doctors who know what they're doing a lot sooner rather than later. Um, so I think that, um, that we need to have continuing medical education begin to focus on this as well. We need to have people be aware that this is a problem. I do think that in certain settings that the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted some issues around disability. Um, for example, especially at our hospital, um, they very rapidly found that people who were deaf and hard of hearing could not communicate effectively when all of the practitioners were wearing masks and face shields. And so they needed to figure out how to have clear masks and so people could see you know, the facial expressions and the mouth movements. They also realized that they needed to allowed trusted caregivers to come in, even though they were not allowing visitors into the hospital rooms of people coming with COVID who had intellectual developmental disabilities or communication disorders. And so I think that there are beginning little hints of, oh, maybe we need to think about people with disability in addition to legitimately worry about disparities relating to racial and ethnic minorities. But I think that our voices just need to be heard, that we need to raise them. And so that's why I love the advocacy focus of your organization, because um, raising your voice, I think, um, is, is what is going gonna, is gonna to need to happen. And, and Lisa, it, it, it strikes me that, in my experience as well, that, that it can be generated, the, the willingness to confront or the unwillingness to um, directly address some of these issues with a physician that you're, that's in your care um, can be intimidating, can be challenging, can, can be just not what you were kind of brought up to do or, or believe in. Um, I'm gonna tell you one strategy that I have used effectively in getting my voice heard is to write it down. Um, it's easy for a physician not to listen to you and to be focused elsewhere on the computer or somewhere else, wherever that may be. But if you can write it down with the electronic medical records today, write it down, send an email, fax your, your story in, it's part of your chart. And more than the doctor has access to that chart. So at some point, somebody in, in your care will listen and will hear that your story. So for me, writing it down and sending an email has been very effective. And in fact, that's what I did with the doctor I confronted. I wrote down my full history 
and my diagnostic impression and sent it to them the day before I then called them. Yeah. And some of you may know that the 21st Century Cures Act that was signed in December of 2016 that Joe Biden was in charge of um, actually has a provision in it that as of April, I think, requires patients to be given free access to their electronic health records. And so everybody should be able to get access to your electronic health records. There are two exceptions to that, and that is psychotherapy records that are kept separate from the rest of the medical record and records that relate to some sort of civil, criminal, or administrative action. Um, so those are the two records that you don't automatically have a right to have access to. But, um, but I think going into your medical records and making sure that what the doctors have written down about you is accurate because there's actually been a fair amount of research about patients accessing their electronic health records and identifying that doctors say a lot of wrong things in the electronic health records. And sometimes identifying these inaccuracies has actually led to improving safety for patients and improving their care. Can't, can't underscore that enough, Lisa. I was when, with a second opinion, uh, ALS physician that refused to write an opinion after, an, after one visit. So I saw them for a second visit and they never did a single physical exam for a second opinion that ended up having contributing to me needing to get a disability attorney in order to successfully have a disability claim because of what they said in the chart. Yeah. And, and the thing is that for some of you who, who don't know, this is another dirty little secret. Electronic medical records are cut and pasted a lot. And so if there's an error in a record, if doctors just simply cut and paste from one note to another, those errors are perpetuated. And so you can have a medical record that's just full of errors if you don't catch some of those errors that are just going to be cut and pasted from visit to visit to visit. So if you have the stomach for it and the interest in doing it, you now have the legal access, the legal right to access your electronic health records, and you should take advantage of that. Thank you, Michael and Lisa, for those two strategies. Those are incredibly useful. And I want to add, uh, Gwen says, uh, I send my questions to my doctor the night before our appointment, gives her time to ruminate, and she can answer in real time during the appointment. That is also a great strategy, Gwen. Great strategy. And often um, it's, it's difficult for the first visit because often the electronic medical record doesn't allow you to email the physician until you've actually physically seen the physician. So it's good for follow-up, but for your, for your first visit, if you have concerns, write it down, bring the paper in, fax it before, et cetera. Thank you, Gwen, and thank you, uh, Michael, for that. Uh, Lauren has a question. Can you talk a little bit more about the challenges of receiving OBGYN care with a disability? Yes, I can do that because I've done a lot of research on pregnancy and reproductive health and people with mobility disability, it's challenging. It's really hard. Um, uh, first of all, um, the average physician doesn't think that you, if you have a disability, have any interest in sexual activity. They think that you are an asexual person. <laughs> um, they think that there's no possibility that you could become pregnant if you're of reproductive age because you can't possibly be sexually active. Um, and so there's just, and, and we've also done some um, interviews with clinicians who are OBGYNs not, uh, and, and also nurses who do um, uh, uh, obstetric type of work and reproductive health type of work. And, they just simply don't have training about how to care for people with disability. And they also, I mean, in this one study that I did where I interviewed 22 women who were wheelchair users and had had, had babies, had gotten pregnant and had babies, 
not a single one of them was routinely weighed during her prenatal care because none of the clinicians had wheelchair accessible exam scales in their, um, in their offices. And some of them were actually recommended to go to the post office to be weighed on a cargo scale or you know a package scale. So I think that it really actually is very, very difficult. And there, there was a survey that was done by a colleague of mine who's a general internist, her name is Tara Lagoo. She did a secret shopper type of survey where she had her research assistants call something like 230 physician practices around the country and describe a patient who could not self-transfer onto an exam table. And they were trying to make an appointment for this patient to be seen. And 22% of physician offices refused to schedule the appointment for this patient it was 44% of OBGYNs. OBGYNs were the worst in terms of the specialists, in terms of refusing to schedule this fictitious patient. And what was interesting is that, um, is that the um, interview protocol that they had for the secret shopper survey allowed the interviewer to just kind of talk a little bit to the office staff about why they refused to schedule the patient. And every word that they said was illegal. It was against the Americans with Disabilities Act because you are not allowed to just simply turn away patients. That is illegal. Um, but we have this evidence, you know, that OBGYNs are especially unprepared here, both in terms of their attitudes about people, but also in terms of the equipment that they have. I think that's an important comment for everybody to know, Lisa, because uh, when you see ALS on the on the chart, uh, you don't want to deal with a complex patient. Right. Um, and my wife also has MS, and we've complexity or complex care patient. We've been turned away before, so it happens. Yeah, it happens, and it's illegal. Um, you know, but but you as a patient are not going to hold up the phone and say, oh, by the way, what you just said to me is illegal. I'm going to bring legal action against you. And, and that's one of the things about the ADA is that it's not a self-enforcing law. Um, there aren't a, a you know, cadre of Department of Justice civil rights attorneys who are out there looking to make sure that um, every healthcare provider is accessible to people with disability. The way that the ADA works is that people with disability have to bring an action about a healthcare provider. And so if you can imagine having to bring an action against your doctor, that's not gonna feel very comfortable to you. And you're probably gonna to have to feel really pressed to be willing to do something like that when you've got so much else going on in your life. So even though we have the protections of the ADA, and in fact, um, the way that they play out may not be as, as rigorous as we'd like them to be. Michael, I see a question in the chat on um, shared decision-making model and, and what suggestions that you might have for people living with ALS to attain shared decision-making process, perhaps with their multidisciplinary ALS clinic. Lisa, do you have any comments on that? Um, I do. I think it's a really, really valuable approach for patients and their clinicians to understand each other. You have to have a doctor who's willing to listen though, who's willing to stop talking and just listen to you speak. You also to have to have a long enough appointment that you can actually have a meaningful conversation. And one of the problems has been that reimbursement has not adequately covered the amount of time that it takes to actually have this meaningful conversation. So there are some health plans now that are realizing that actually having meaningful conversations between doctors and their patients is cost effective in the long term because you get to kind of deal with issues that can highlight concerns that should, if they're addressed early, can actually save complications and money down the road. Um, but this is one of the barriers to having those kind of informed conversations with a doctor who's willing to listen to you. 
stress that again, underscore that. I, to just to tell a little bit, psychosomatic medicine was my practice. That is, it's not typical psychiatry. You're, you're the psychiatrist that's in a general hospital setting. You're seeing medical and surgical patients. You're often seeing the patients that the medical or surgical doctors are having a difficult time with. They don't understand what's going on. They think it's psychiatric. You get called in. So I spent my career doing that. And most of the time, I would say 80% of the time, I would find a medical problem or surgical problem. And it wasn't mental health. And because of that, and I will go to my grave saying that the best exam is a good history. And to this day, you cannot replace a good history. No test, I don't care what it is, no test replaces the value of a good history. So if you're not being heard, keep trying. Yes. We are all caught up on questions. So um, Michael, if you wanted to. I'll just, yeah, if you, if you talk, if you uh, other questions. Um, Lisa, what was the thing that most surprised you out of the recent study, apart from the 82% number? Well, I think the 40.7% that that was a very low number who said that they strong are strongly confident that they can provide equal quality of care to people with disability. That is not a socially desirable response. You know, doctors are pretty confident about their knowledge. They're not shrinking violets. Um, they're, they're not willing to say that they don't know things, right? Um, and so the fact that um, the majority of doctors admitted that they are not strongly confident in being able to provide equal quality of care to people with disability was pretty troubling. Okay. What about what I, what I found surprising, and I know it might not be powered or the, the depth is not there to make definitive comments, but I was surprised by some of the differences um, between either gender or race and some of the physicians' attitudes and beliefs. Can you comment on those? Yeah, sure. So, um, so in terms of welcoming um, people into their practices, well, let me just start back with the quality of life. So women physicians were a lot less likely than male physicians to report worse quality of life for people with disability. So women are more willing to view quality of life as, as the same or okay for people with disability than our male physicians. Um, it's also interesting that safety net providers, so um, physicians who see a lot more poor patients are also a lot less likely than non-safety net physicians to report worse quality of life for people with disability. And so that's not so surprising either that physicians who are used to seeing patients who are socioeconomically disadvantaged are less likely to view quality of life as bad. Um, we did uh, what are called full multivariable regression models where we put in all sorts of predictor variables into the models to see you know, um, what would affect whether a physician would be welcoming for a patient with disability. Women physicians were a lot more welcoming than men. Older physicians were a lot less welcoming than younger physicians. Private practices were a lot less likely welcoming than academic medical centers, so teaching hospital practices. Um, and patient, uh, physicians who felt very confident and their ability to care equally for people with disability were a lot more welcoming than other doctors. Interesting. Uh, those, those findings are interesting. Yeah, they um, are. Yeah. Another question. Um, it took my call. I mean, I'm a, I'm a physician. I'm living with ALS. Yet it took my colleague friend to tell me, do you think this bias is going on? How do we know? How, how, what, how will a patient know that biases might be playing, biases towards disability might be playing, a, having an impact on their care? 
Well, it's a it's a great question. And I think that one of the reasons that I was so intent on publishing this as the first paper to come from this survey is that I think it's very validating. You know, I, again, as I told you, I've interviewed probably 200 people with disability, and a lot of times they will talk to me about the erroneous assumptions and the way that physicians kind of treat them, but they're never sure that, you know, they, they kind of don't really know what's going on. What these findings show us is they validate that the presumption that doctors may be underestimating our quality of life is probably true. Um, you know, even Michael, my friend, who's such a, you know, strong advocate for himself and, um, and somebody who can clearly speak for himself, um, was unable to get the attention of physicians and, and wasn't willing to say, look, I think that you're just not paying attention to me for whatever reason. Um, and so I think just, you know, again, that's one of the reasons why it was just so wonderful to hear about your AMA, IMALS advocacy perspective, because you're trying to self-empower, you're trying to empower your members to advocate for themselves, to feel that their feelings are valid. Um, and, and, and so just kind of think about, hmm, maybe this doctor just isn't asking me about my quality of life, doesn't really understand about my life. And so um, can I have a conversation with my doctor about my quality of life? Um, and I, I think that, you know, that kind of self-advocacy mm -hmm. is also important. I'll add to that. And, and uh, it, was, it was through in my, one of my experiences being an inpatient in hospital. Um, and, the, you know, the doctors come in and out and they're in and out in a very short period of time. And in hospital, often it's a different doctor every day because the hospitals change every day or it's the way different systems work. Um, and so, and I'll, and I'll underscore this, the nursing staff, is so critical as a potential partner in your advocacy with the physician to help them under they more often than not i've been able to the nurses listen and pass the, the information on to the doctor and that's how i've been able to advocate well in a hospital setting um, so I wouldn't I, I just underscore that nurses, it's not just the doctor that's part of that practice or that setting. It's there's other healthcare professionals associated with that that are involved in your care that you can uh, uh, approach as well. Yeah, that's why I think I, I mentioned in response to Gwen that if her doctor is not talking to her, she should see whether there's a nurse practitioner in the office and maybe try to enlist that person um, to uh, to help her kind of make a, um, an inroad with a physician. I, so I agree completely. Just want to um, read Jeremy's comment, which is aligned with what uh, you all are saying. One thing I think is valuable from self-advocacy standpoint is finding an ally within the clinical staff, within the clinic staff. I would encourage people with ALS to find an ally who will listen to them and advocate to their physician. Social workers are great in that regard. Yeah. 100% agree. Yeah, I agree with that, except for the social worker that Michael had. <laughs> said that palliation was what their goal was, you know? So I think that, um, that remain cautious, remain optimistic, but cautious, um, you know, know what your views are and, um, and make sure that you find somebody to partner with who, um, who, uh, who reflects what your, what your preferences are. And, and I would say, I would add to that, it's, it's don't, don't think of, don't look at title. Don't look at who they are, what, what job they do. Relationships are relationships, people are people. I'm a psychiatrist. It's about who you have a relationship with in that clinic. And it doesn't matter if they're social worker, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, respiratory therapy, you know those people, you know the people that you see in the clinic, that you have that relationship, that connection with. And, and those people can be help be advocates with you. Yeah. I had a... Any, any follow-up to this study, Lisa? It's a great question. And we 
are going to try to be able to do a similar survey with other healthcare professionals um, to see if your theory, for example, about nurses bears out. Um, I suspect that it will, but I'm not 100% sure. I need okay. to have that proven empirically. And what are your thoughts? We've talked about physician perceptions all, all this whole time. What are the patients living with a disability? What are their perceptions on the quality of care that they get? Well, their perceptions about the quality of care is that it, it often is not great um, because often their wishes are not respected and the communication is not what they want it to be. But I think also the issue about their quality of life that I don't mean to imply that every person with a disability is going to have a good quality of life because some disabling conditions yeah. can be very painful, can be emotionally just very devastating. And so I don't mean to appear to have rose colored glasses about this. I'm a realist. You know, I've had MS for 44 years. I'm pretty reality based. Um, but I think that the surveys that have been done of people with disability suggest that we adapt, we figure things out. You know, we, you know, 24 7, 365, we live with our disability, we figure it out. And we don't want to live in tragedies. And so the majority of surveys of people with disability suggest that they view their quality of life as good. And, you know, my friend Michael, as his healthcare proxy, I repeatedly ask him because I know that there are going to be times when I might have to make a, a decision relating mm -hmm. to his life. Like he got COVID in April. Um, and so one of the first conversations with I had with him after he he got that was Michael, are your preferences still this, you know, so I know explicitly mm -hmm. what his preferences are. Um, I think that, uh, you know, people with disability, even with significant disability may value their quality of life in a way that other people might not perceive. I think that's really important and really speaks to the ALS community. And I know biases that I have. I think one thing to underscore is quality of life is a personal internal decision. Completely. And no one can decide that for you. Right. And when people make assumptions, they can make erroneous assumptions that can impact you and your life. And I say that because in, in the, 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 the issue that faces us as, as an ALS community is tracheostomy, okay. right? And, and the opinions on that are widely varied. I know, you know, and, and what one believes when they don't have it might be entirely different than when you're faced with that scenario and, and, and the choices you make. And I know, I know ALS patients that are trach that live, they, they say they have a, a great quality of, a good quality of life. I won't say great, but a good quality of life and are content. Yeah. Um, and that decision won't be shared by everybody, um, but it's an yeah. internal personal thing. And those decisions might change over time. Like one of the most powerful interviews I had for my When Walking Fails project was with a man who had ALS. And when I met him, he wasn't yet using a vent. His voice was a little on the weak side. So our interview was a little more truncated than it would have been with other people. And at that time, he was saying that he didn't want to use a vent. But as time went on, he changed his mind. Mm -hmm. He did want to use a vent. And so he did use event for quite a while. And he had a very good marriage um, with a wife that he loved very much. And, um, and um, so he made the decision to use the vent. And then when he decided that he no longer wanted to, he made that decision as mm -hmm. well. And, um, and I mean, just hearing the story about how that played out, it was just very powerful and meaningful. And so recognizing that people's attitudes might change with the circumstances is also really important. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent points. And yeah. something that again, under, uh, again, I'll, I'll, I'll stress, as ALS patients, we know our conditions progress, they change over time. And these aren't one-off discussions that you have once. These are discussions that you have with your team of care providers on an ongoing basis, as Lisa points out, because your, your opinions or your beliefs may change. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we don't have any, oh, Lisa, did you wanna say something? 
No, I just wanted to end on a happier note. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's been a it's been a pleasure talking to you, and I'm just so struck by the fact that you have a, a focus towards empowerment and advocacy that's really, really good because that's what you need to be able to deal with what we've been talking about. Thank you. I want to, on behalf of IMALS, the ALS community, I want to thank you. Your, your engagement, your willingness to participate and to have a transparent dialogue are, are really valuable to us. And I think we've all learned a lot. So thank well, you. Thank you. It's just been an honor to be with you guys. Thank you. Michael, any closing comments? Well, um, yeah, I would just say, you know, if you are, um, if you need help becoming empowered, which sounds a little bit odd, right? Getting help to become empowered. But I would say that this is practice, that we're all practicing at life. And so the way you get good at doing something is sometimes trying it not in front of the professional, but with somebody else, um, that we do have a navigation program. So if you ever want to practice what you're going to say to a medical professional, you know, please feel free to reach out to us. That's um, imals.org slash navigation or get help at imals.org. It's an incredible team of people who can help, help you practice, help connect you to the resources that you need. Um, and so I would end on that note. Um, Michael, one, one, one thing before we end, I know you, we, we said you're recording it. And I noticed a number of people were popping on at two o'clock thinking there might, you might not have recognized the time, um, uh, the time zone that we were doing it in. Um, will you communicate your, your intentions or plans if, if this does get reposted or, or, or shared socially? Yes, yeah, so I'm gonna send out uh, this recording to everybody who has signed up, uh, but it will also be posted to our YouTube channel. Um, and for those of you who uh, showed up and um, weren't able to ask your question or didn't feel comfortable, you can feel free to send me a question. And, I and I'm happy to take them by email as well. So you can um, get it to Michael and I can help as well. Yep. Uh, so my email is uh, pretty simple. It's Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L at imals.org. So just Michael at imals.org. <laughs> Thank you both uh, for coming and speaking about this and having a discussion with the community. It, uh, it means so much to me and was just an incredible, um, incredible discussion. And thank you, especially to Michael to, for bringing this up and asking us to put this on. Thank you all. Thank you. Take thank care, you everybody. Really. Hope Bye, you everybody. Day.